preaching and preached for congregations in Florida, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana, and is currently preaching in Mississippi. And uh, even though he was born in Yankee land, he is a converted Southerner. Is that right? <clears throat> I, uh, when I was getting the motel room, I knew that he, he kind of lived half hog, so uh, I told him I'd get him the presidential suite. It's just like the other room, but they put a picture of Obama in the room. <laughs> He's going to speak to us on a uh, very timely topic. It has to do with preachers training schools. And one has to ask the question, are they, uh, are they proponents or advocates for uh, faithfulness and doctrinal purity? Or are they uh, seeking to divide the church or to promote their own agenda? And I think uh, uh, Gene will address that question very well, and it's something that we all need to know about. Gene, come speak to us. I was nervous about delivering the lesson. I found out Brother Connor was going to be introducing me. It changed. <laughs> um, I want to comment on Brother Oxenine's lesson. It, it, that's a very, very timely lesson. Um, I have, I'm, I'm just personally so concerned about our kids today that when I'm at Bible camp um, and the, bo one of the boys' cabins I had to be counseled for, I tell my boys, and I've had fifth and sixth grade boys all the way up to the high school age, if you have any questions you want a Bible answer to, ask the question. And if you don't know the words to use, use the ones you know. We'll get you an answer and we'll fix the words. And it's amazing the questions that five and six year old boys, five and six, fifth and sixth grade boys can ask and you're just dumbfounded by what they know, by the topics they're aware of. And I'm so concerned about it that in the last number of years I've been thinking about developing a series of lessons and I finally decided it almost have to be in a kind of a youth rally, and I hate that word, a youth rally kind of a situation, and divide it in half girls and then boys. And for the, boy, for the girls it would be if you were my daughter. And I do the same question for the boys, if you were my son. My son, uh, Justin, our son Justin, uh, he and I talked. Uh, when we talked, we talked at length and we talked in depth, and I was very, very, very blunt in passing on information of my philosophy. Uh, and matter of fact, my daughter-in-law, our daughter-in-law, has said, has said thank you very much. Uh, I want him to know how to behave as a Christian young man. Uh, I am so, and I'm impressed with the young ladies that, that stayed with us uh, uh, during our, our, our lectureship when Sister West came up and, and brought her daughter and, and uh, uh, the Parker girls with them. I'm very impressed with the young ladies. And, and I just told Ms. Uh, Sister Parker a few minutes ago that if my son were that age, we'd try to arrange a marriage. <laughs> uh, but I, I, and, and the titles, and, and the, what I would do is just really, just, just, just really be very, very blunt uh, and, and try not to overly shock anybody about what we had to talk about. Brethren, we are losing our children. We are losing our children. And it, and it frightens me when I, think about, when I think about that. But anyways, uh, good lesson, brother. My topic, religion and morality from God or Man's question for our, for our lectureship series. Preacher training schools, are they living up to the reason they were begun? Uh, I am a product of the Florida School of Preaching. I don't blame anybody for it. Um, I take full responsibility for what I am and do the best I can with what I've got to work with. But uh, it's serious. It, it's a very, very serious topic. Uh, to answer the question, religion and morality will be the basis for whatever world view that you possess. And every person has a world view, thus everybody has a religion. When somebody says you ought not to do that, they are, they are telling us a little portion of their religion, of their worldview. You ought not to criticize homosexuals. That's their worldview. That's their religion. When Dawkins says, oh, you Christians ought not to talk like that, that's his religion. And he's very religious about professing what he believes. I would appreciate his honesty, just don't like his worldview. But your worldview is what you use to explain why things are the way they are and how you ought to live in light of that explanation. 
As a consequence, we, know, we must ask what informs your view of right and wrong, a belief that religion and morality is a subjective individual thing or that religion and morality are transcendent of the human experience being absolute in substance, objective in outlook, and obtainable by the, by, uh, in nature by man. If I can't know what God wants me to know, and, and I'm okay, there's nothing wrong, the wires are not broken or pulled down, then, then it's the responsibility of God to communicate to me in such a way that I can know. He holds me accountable. Therefore, it's, it's given to me in such a way that I can know what God wants me to know. And I'm responsible for it. John 12, 48, I'm going to meet it in the last day. And he's going to hold me accountable for it. Um, our, I believe my topic is crucial for us to consider in light of this lectureship's theme regarding morality, religion and morality as a source. For if man is the source, then it has no import. It doesn't matter what we say here this afternoon. All this, it doesn't matter what we talk about. Uh, Brother Brown's questionnaire he handed out has no significance if there isn't something that we ought to be doing. But if, on the other hand, God is the fountainhead of, uh, and source for truth, then the implications can be devastating depending upon the doctrinal stance assumed by the sponsoring congregations, by congregations and individuals sending support to these schools, to board members, to administrations, to staff, students of these various schools of preaching. I used to think I would like to be an elder one day. I've had pause to reconsider that because of all the problems that an eldership has to face and has to deal with. I've said, uh, we've had discussions, I've had discussions with Brother Brown and the rest of the brethren here uh, that we've met at lectureships and so on about, well, if I were to look for a congregation, where would I go to look? Talk to Brother Francis. He had a hard time trying to find one on the short notice that he had. And that's very true. It took, for, when it was time for us to leave down in Zachary, Louisiana, it took us six or eight months, huh? about six or eight months to even find a prospect, to find a prospect. Now, what's that say about us? What's that say? I mean, and, and to be an elder trying to find somebody that's sound, I, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I really wouldn't be able to sleep because I, as an elder, as a pastor for the flock, as a bishop, I would be held personally accountable for what's done from the pulpit. It'd scare me to death. We need to consider the place of the church in this effort, first of all. The church being considered as that blood-bought institution that we read about upon the pages of the New Testament. By the way, when I'm doing personal work, I like to use that. Because somebody says, well, what does your church believe? Well, given the current situation, who knows? But when you put it this way, the, 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 that blood-bought institution that you read about upon the pages of the New Testament, it causes them to get out of their rut and to look at what they believe from another perspective. And then you can start a, a constructive conversation. But Jesus said he would build his church, Matthew 16, 18. The church was built as a result of fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, which goes against the religious world today. Mark 9, 1, 1 and all these, uh, the other passages that we could look at in regards to that. The reason this knowledge is important is because the church is to make known the manifold wisdom of God. It's the church that does that. Nobody else is qualified. Nobody else is authorized. It is us, you and me. The Lord's people. The mere existence of the church taught the principalities and powers in heavenly places God's manifold wisdom. If the church did that to them, then what do you suppose our job is to the community, to those around about us? Look at what happened when you just put some letters on a sign out front. You thought the world was coming to an end, and for some people it probably did. But nonetheless, that's our job. God's wisdom is demonstrated in the makeup of the church's population. The terms of conditions of entrance for each individual and the reasons for those terms and conditions. God's a holy God. God wants holy people to follow him. He wants all those people to follow him to not only become holy, but to stay holy, to maintain that holiness. And he's told us how to do that. Brother William Klein stated, God is the Holy One of Israel. God is the Son. God the Son is the Holy One. Acts 3.14, God the Spirit is the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. How can his people be other than that and have fellowship with it? Well, it can't happen. Manifestation of God's holiness is seen in the terms of entrance, that there is something specific I have to do. Ever since I trusted in Jesus Christ, my personal Savior, can't find it. It's not there. I, I've asked people. I can't find it. Oh, I hold my Bible up. Where is that written? Uh, and that's about all they can say because there's nothing else they can say. In the book of Acts, we ought to take note of each case wherein those that were sinners gained remission for their sins. 
prior to this salvation being obtained, we ought to, prior to that being done rather, we ought first to understand how through the agency of teaching, and, and that generally, it's always done through the agency of teaching, and that generally done through the use of words. And this, thus we get into preaching. God first communicated to Adam and Eve through words that we have record of in Genesis chapter 1, 28. Even in dreams, those whom he wanted to warn, God still used words, John cha or Genesis chapter 20. God spoke to the prophets using words, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. The Lord even speaks to us today using words, Hebrews chapter 1. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Well, if that's not words, then somebody needs to explain the passage to me. So again, we see the importance of preaching. In each case of the granting of remission of sins in the book of Acts, it was invariably was accomplished through the use of words. On the day of Pentecost, they spoke words. On some, in Samaria... And the Ethiopian eunuch, Saul, Cornelius, the Philippian jailer, Lydia, all of these accounts, words were used. There isn't an account of salvation in the book of Acts where somebody just got it. They woke up one morning and said, Huzzah, I'm saying. It's not there. They all used words in that conversion process. We could also add those that heard but refused to listen that were approached with words. Uh, those in Acts chapter 2 that heard but did not gladly receive the word. Even those hearing Paul in Acts chapter 24 even though they rejected what he had to say. In chapter 6, when Stephen had engaged in evangelism, uh, he used words in disputing with uh, certain Jews. Then in chapter 7, he again used words in his apology of the gospel, citing 1 Peter chapter 3 and 15. But this background, what is the place of the church in all this? In giving his final directives to the apostles, in Matthew 28, for instance, Jesus set in motion a process that is ongoing and will continue to be so until he returns in judgment. He set that in motion. By direction of the Lord Jesus, the, the church is therefore to be a teaching organization. No one else, no other organization has the authority to carry out God's commands. That's you and me, nobody else. It is the responsibility of baptized faithful believers to continue the work obtained, ordained rather, by the Lord Jesus. I know this is to be the case because the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, in which he told the apostles to make disciples and to teach them to observe his commandments. What did he just told them to do? Tell them to do, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Well, if that's what he told them, and he turned around and told them to tell, to tell them to teach other people what he just told them, what are you and I supposed to be doing? Teaching? That's exactly it. Brethren, there's no, oh, I just don't feel comfortable. Well, we'll take a number and stand in line. You're, you're in good company. Do you, do you think it's really comfortable for Brother Brown to get up there and say some of the things he says? Do you suppose the elders feel comfortable when they ask him or get up and amen some of the things he's had to say? I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure they're glad to, be, to have the opportunity, somebody faithful like that, to do it. I'm sure all that's the case, but do you, who likes to take criticism? Who likes being criticized? Let the record show nobody does. And you can't, those watching this later on can't, aren't going to pan the crowd and see nobody raise their hand on that. Now we must ask, what is the role or function of the blood-bought body in the church in the world today? As previously noted, the church is to make known the manifold wisdom of God. Again, Ephesians 3 and verse 10. The angels observed the establishment of the church learned from God's unfolding wisdom. When they saw those things happening, and they, they, didn't, they didn't get the scorecard. They, they didn't know who the team was until it started being unveiled. Most all, a man also learns of God's wisdom by observing the institution of the church and its ongoing operation through the efforts of her faithful membership. So that's why, brethren, when somebody in our congregation needs to be instructed and eventually marked and avoided as one practicing a false doctrine or living a, a, an, a, an immoral lifestyle, we need to do that, and, and regardless of what people think, they're going to learn what purity means. Well, what's, what's purity mean? Well, we just showed you that. Were you not watching? We'll, we'll tell you again. The church has been given the task of world evangelism. Now, we have Jesus as our example. Uh, the Lord, came, uh, the Lord uh, Jesus came to do the Father's will, John 4 and 34. The church accomplishes its, its task by various means. Uh, they do it through various missionaries sent to other places, through personal involvement of the individual congregational members. That's how this, the, this, the work is put forward. We must not overlook the fact that the church accomplishes all that it does, listen to this, through the individual hands of church members. Went to, to uh, the church up in Paintsville, Kentucky, back in 84. Um, and uh, they had a radio program. Never had spoken on a radio program. 15 minutes live every day, 12 to 12.15. 12, 
And the, the elders, uh, the fellow had been there before me, had, had stockpiled a bunch of tapes, and we were using those tapes. And the elders kept saying, well, Brother Hill, when are you going to start? When are you going to start? When? Ah, I don't know. Finally started. Well, I tell you what, you talk about being nervous. However, the point is, is that the church, through my efforts, such as they were, were speak, was speaking and teaching the gospel on WSIP every day, noon, to 1215. The church was doing it. Now that doesn't mean the brethren were standing down there in a Greek chorus. But the church was still accomplishing what it was told to do by Jesus by having me go speak on the radio. When you brethren, when the brethren here write articles, it is the church doing it. When the, when the hungry are fed, it is the church and the deacons carry the, the whatever is necessary. It is the church doing it, but the church does it through the individual hands of the members accomplishing the task. Otherwise, we'd have confusion. Consider Paul's missionary journey to the regions of Lycia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Pisidia and Laconia, and, and, and they heard the word by the collective efforts of the church in Antioch of Syria through the desires of that good congregation. They sent out those brethren. When a church preaches the gospel over the radio, it does it through the hands, the voice of a particular person. The local congregation, when duly constituted and working effectively as the authorized conduit, for benevolence and evangelism. Now, that's how we do those things. So by what authority does a congregation, or for that matter, an individual Christian operate? Now, our realm of authority, for, uh, of, of action, of authority, authoritative action, is well defined. Christianity's truly function, truly fu Christians truly function only upon a basis of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. How do I know what it is I'm supposed to do, and, and doing it by God's will, by simply reading what the Bible has to tell me, and then reasoning about it? God's word is the rule of faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, walk by faith, not by sight. 1 John 1, 7, we walk in the light as he is in light. But it is also the limit of our faith beyond which the faithful do not venture. If any man abideth not in the gospel of Christ, I can't, I can't go fall short of it. I can't go beyond it without sin. I have to do it and it only. And when I'm doing that, I'm doing my job. Well, we've not been very successful. Well, we've done what we're supposed to do, and we're giving the increase up to God. It just may be hard packed soil. may have to change the blade on the tiller, but we still need to go after it. How then do I determine what I or a congregation am authorized to do? Well, the Bible authorizes in three ways, explicit statement, an implied statement, or through approved account of action. And I don't have a whole lot of time to go into that, but, but here's an example. Since none of our names would have appeared in any of the original manuscripts, and they don't, and unless you're really old, how would, how would we determine anything else contained in them and then would apply to us? Now, this comes out of a note from a particular instructor's notes that I took in class, so blaming him if I get it wrong. Or where is the explicit statement with my, my name appearing in it that tells me to do anything? Now, to shorten this discussion down, in a general way, I can know the Bible applies to me as well as to a congregation today by at least the following three passages in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31, where, uh, where all mankind everywhere are commanded to repent. Well, that's pretty much us. We are mankind, and we're pretty much everywhere. So we've been commanded to repent, even though our name's not there. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, find faithful men, teach them, that they may find faithful men and teach them. Brethren, who's left out of that? Nobody, by implication. Everybody's included in that. Now, since the church is to be the teaching organization, and since authority is generic in nature, then uh, such authority, rather, is generic in nature, then any effort that does not contradict any other scriptural principle would be an authorized activity for a congregation to undertake. We have examples of private teaching in Acts chapter 18, 26. We have examples of public teaching in Acts chapter 6 and verse 9 and chapter 27. We have an example of the church congregating to teach and be taught to which the public has access, 1 Corinthians 14 and 26 and following. Paul taught an assembly of the church that had assembled for worship, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Each of these examples is an expedient demonstrating various methods which we may use to carry out the mission of the church. It should be pointed out that any act, that an action is expedient only if it is lawful to do in the first place. It's expedient to have carpet or not have carpet. It's expedient to have a, to have a church built. It's just an expedient. We're told to gather upon the first day of the week. Where are we going to gather? Well, I don't know. What do you think? Well, let's go down here to nice church building. Let's gather there. That, that's an expedient. We don't have to have it, but it's there for us if we want. 
Now, since we know the age of the miraculous has passed, how do we obtain truly qualified teachers, preachers, deacons, and elders, and anyone else desirous of effectively ministering? Again, we have the model of Jesus in training the disciples that became his apostles. How did, what, how did Jesus do what he did? He just didn't lay hands on somebody and then strangle, they could preach the gospel. He had them follow him and watch him, and they, just, and they still didn't get it after three years. Pretty much like any other school of preaching. You get out there and actually start doing it. What was I thinking of? You know, all of us and we call back to school and cry on somebody's shoulder. What am I going to do? And they tell you, well, just go preach some more. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I was looking for something more specific. But a local congregation could organize and operate a system of classes that some call Sunday school or Bible school. I personally prefer Bible, uh, Bible school or even Bible classes as it's broader than Sunday school. You can't have Sunday school on Tuesday night. But you can have a Bible class. Such efforts are, of course, expedient, being a more formal and form, uh, institution of Bible teaching efforts. Now, a local congregation, we're getting close now, could undertake to organize a training school whose purpose would be for the instruction of men to preach the gospel or to more effectively fulfill any other office mentioned in the New Covenant to better carry out the mandate of Christ for, for world evangelism. Such an effort would be completely in line with formally organized Bible classes, vacation Bible school, and now there's some people who object to vacation Bible school. Well, we shouldn't have it because a lot of bad things go on there. Well, just stop doing the bad things. Whatever they may be, just stop that and do what's right. And when you tell them that, they go blank. They don't know what to say then. It'd be, it'd be fun if it wasn't so serious. Um, but but we, we do those things, we have those opportunities, singing schools and so forth. We should note that the church managed to survive without such efforts for thousands of years, but we must also acknowledge that such efforts have been effective. When you have a singing school, the people learn how to lead singing. When you have a singing school, the song leaders learn how to beat time. And they're no longer, sometimes you think it's not song leading, but song pushing. Well, we need the training. Now, how would an effort for the training of, for preachers, teachers, and so forth how would that be organized would be up to the individual congregation. Whatever you brethren want to do, as long as it doesn't violate biblical principle, you're, freely, you're absolutely free to do. Other congregations, seeing the value of the effort, could support the school. Let's just say that the Spring Church, well, I don't know, wanted to start a, a school of biblical studies. That'd be an original idea, wouldn't it? And we over there in Indianola, Mississippi, heard about it, and, and, and we want to support that thing. Well, let's send them a check. We could do one. Of the, we could hire somebody to go down there and help them out, or we could send a check to represent that salary. And if not, why not? There's some brother who object to that, but they have other problems also that we're not dealing with in this lesson. Uh, support it with money. We supplies, teachers, prayers, and commendations. Any co accommodations for government concerns not compromising scriptural integrity could, of course, be made. Any other material would be expedient given the local. You know, uh, when I went to school, we had a, we had a grammar class. We had, uh, had a, a speaking class, had an English class. Sister Rose Daughter he taught, us, taught us English. Poor woman. <laughs> she had a tough row, <laughs> I'm telling you. But she stuck with it, and we appreciate and loved her for doing so. Now, at the risk of stating the obvious, the Bible would be the basis for the curriculum with faithfulness to its message being the cornerstone principle. Now, introductory material is over. Let's get to the lesson. Preacher training schools, are they living up to the reason they were begun? I got this, and I said, boy, I can do this. And then I started researching, and I said, man. So I finally concentrated. Instead of trying to find all the history of all the other schools and the brotherhood and all the problems they've had over these many years, I just decided to concentrate on where I've been. A young man of the Indianola Church, Christ in Indianola, Mississippi, comes to me and says, you know, Brother Gene, I, I want to be a preacher. Uh, he might figure he can't do any worse than what I'm doing, but he wants to be a preacher. And, and it obviously... Uh, uh, he wants to find a place where he can go and get some good instruction. And knowing him and counseling him, I determined that he would indeed be of great service as a preacher. He'd, be, he'd do a good job. And I have one young man in mind, as a matter of fact. So what would we do? Now, this, I'm saying we, I say we. What would I do? If I were the one he came to and said, preacher, what should I do? Here's what I, here's what Gene Hill would do. Um, I would, uh, I would um, contact somebody. I'd contact the brethren and say the Spring Church here and interrogate them for the purpose of determining if indeed they, as well as what they offer, are acceptable. Now, I may not know Brother Brown and the eldership here in this congregation, but I've heard about it. I call up Brother Hype Tarrant. Yeah, but down there in Spring, Texas, give them a, give them a call and see what, they, see what they have to say. Now, why would I investigate? I want to know what the facts of the case are. 
Paul says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. I want to find out about things. I want to find out what the spirit of the people behind the organization is. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they are of God because many false prophets are going out into the world. And it pains me to have to preach a lesson like this. I'm just, I'll be honest with you. I don't like doing this because it involves people I know personally that, that are my friends. I want to be able to identify what the spiritual and intellectual state of the instructors and curriculum are before I recommend it to anybody. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid. How do I know what Brown these folks down here teach if I don't call them up and ask them? How do I know that? Years ago, when I was preaching up in, in, um, in uh, Kentucky, Global Music was preaching a, uh, a gospel meeting down in uh, Prestonsburg, Kentucky. And so Jerry and I went down to, you know, I wanted to hear Global Brother Music preach and teach and get to know him and introduce myself, and we were talking. And we were talking about congregations finding preachers. And, he, and this is what he said to me, if not exactly, almost exactly. He said, Brother Hill, if I were in eldership and I had interviewed a preacher six months ago, I'd re-interview him again to see if he hasn't changed six months. This was 1985 or thereabouts. Six months. I'd re-interview him to see if he hasn't changed. What can I tell you? Uh, Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Same word as I understand. I'm not, I don't know that much Greek. Know enough to avoid it. But it's the same word basically in the Greek. It identifies somebody for something. One of them is to avoid and the other is to follow. Oh, you can't mark people. Oh, really? Then somebody needs to explain this to me then. I've missed it if that's the case. What, what would I hope my interrogatory would determine? That the brethren directly involved with the school had open hands and hearts. That they were glad to provide all the information necessary for us to determine their soundness in the faith. That they were as Jesus was when he was approached by a serious questioner and provided appropriate information. Mark chapter 12, 28 and following. Does anyone associated with the ministry of a local congregation, the congregation itself, or individuals in that congregation have any right to teach, to preach, to practice, or in any other way or manner adhere to or propagate that which is false? And the answer is no, they do not. How is it that somebody, some brethren can do that and, and shave in the morning? It's beyond me. If you weren't laughing, you'd cry. God had questions for Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. What have you done? God had questions for Cain. What meaneth this blood? Genesis chapter 4, 6. Joshua had questions for Achan. Genesis, Joshua chapter 7. Tell us what you did. Israel had questions for the northern brethren in Joshua 22. They heard that they, folks up there are building an, ark, uh, uh, um, an altar. Man, we better go check this thing out. We don't want this plague. And the plague is still affecting us, Joshua and all them brethren, all those brethren said. Brethren, all those Israelites said. And they went up and checked it out. What, what, do you, what do you think you're all doing up here? They're from the north. What do you expect? By the way, Brother Con, I've repented of the sin. You know, I got here as soon as I could after I found out about it. Why be afraid of serious questions asked by honest hearts? I, brethren, seriously, seriously. I have a list of 61 questions that are precisely worded, clearly answerable, and either with either a true, false, yes, no, or either or response. I include this with every resume I send out when I'm prospecting for a congregation. And my answers are marked in bold and placed in brackets so there's no confusion. Now, if somebody reads that questionnaire and doesn't know, they're probably in a state of grace. I don't know what else to tell you. Additionally, I will explain in detail why I have provided a particular answer. I w I'm glad to answer a questionnaire. Now, not this one Brown just handed out, by the way. <laughs> when a man refuses to answer or gets mealy-mouthed or starts crawfishing, when he does answer, he's hiding something. He's hiding something. Brethren, listen, I, I had an elder one time. Well, we were in the process of appointing elders, and I mentioned the, the idea of 
answering a questionnaire. He says, I've been preaching and teaching in this area long enough that people ought to know what I believe. Why not tell us again in detail? What are you hiding? What are you hiding? Why won't you tell us? I've included two articles in my manuscript. One is an open letter from Terry Hightower directed to Jackie Steersman and the FSOP Board of Directors, which includes some of the elders from South Florida Avenue Church of Christ in Lakeland, Florida. They have the other oversight of the school. The other is an article written by Brother Steersman that appeared in the October 2008 Harvester, the official publication of the Florida School of Preaching. Again, I've graduated from there in 1978 when Brother Carr was still the director. In his letter consisting of seven points, Brother Hightower asked three precisely worded questions that can be answered either true or false, to which Terry provided his own answers, indicating they are not trick questions. As, uh, as the first point, and in the remaining six points, he discussed his close ties and so forth, and you can read the material to get that. Now, in Jackie's letter, in response, he uses the examples of Jesus being asked questions in Matthew chapter 27 and so forth. It is interesting in concluding the article, he asks a series of five questions himself, as if he somehow expects an answer. Now, lest you misunderstand me, I understand and appreciate irony when I see it. And I saw it. Here's the issue. Since Jackie cited Peter's comment in 1 Peter 2 and verse 23, and let's, let's just look at that and have it before us. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now, that'd be a scary statement. That's a scary concept to bring up. At what point does honest inquiry cross some line and begins to vilify? Where does the vilification begin in Terry's article? Read it for yourself. Where does Jackie discover that the abuse and or name calling begin? Does he truly think that he is being reviled? Do all of those that support Dave Miller and his fallacious doctrines equate themselves to God's sacrificial lamb? Surely not. Why do they feel, because they can't know, they don't need to respond to legitimate questions regarding their actions? Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were more than happy to provide an answer regarding their actions in building a duplicate altar. We don't want you to forget us. We don't want you to think that we're not part of you. Do these brethren truly believe that they did not need to answer their brethren and those that have generously supported them over the years? Have they come so far that they are above reproach if they indeed have done anything worthy of reproach? Man, if I've done, if y'all think I've done something wrong, I'd be glad to tell you otherwise. I'd be glad to explain to you what I was thinking of and why I did what I did. Why is it that our schools of preaching, other ministries, uh, brethren, start, as well as colleges that are associated with the brotherhood, have such problems with doctrinal soundness? What happens? These efforts today have become as railroads became in times past. The problem with the railroads today is a hundred years ago, those fellows stopped thinking that they were in, that they, that they thought they were just in the railroad business. They started thinking, or they stopped thinking they were in the transportation business. Our brethren today, now this is just from my humble perspective, such as it is, they stopped thinking that they were in the tr training program, thought they were running schools of preaching. They're not there to run a school of preaching. They're there to teach people. How do they teach people? By calling people vile. How do you teach somebody that way? Now, I grant you, I've worked in a county jail down in Polk County, Florida, and there are some vile people in there. They needed to be called, but they need to be, well, that's a whole other lesson. Serious things and painful things to have happen to them. But we, have you ever heard the phrase, follow the money? When you want to determine why change has taken place, when you build a multi-million dollar complex with dormitories and units for married people and a beautiful library and new classrooms, and you start having to take a doctrinal stand and one of your money fellows calls up and said, if you don't change your tune, we're going to cut the spigot off. You wonder why things happen the way they wonder the way they happen. Brethren, I think that's just the way it is. 
And you can disagree with me and prove me wrong, and I'd be glad. I'll stand right up here and I'll preach it just as hard to fix it as I did to get it wrong if this is wrong. I don't believe it is. I don't believe for a moment it is. It's influence. It's who's going to like us and not like us. Like I said, I worked in the county jail. I've had some evil people call me things you all probably never thought about. I don't think. So I'm not too worried about other folks might, might have to say. We see the same thing when a local congregation has increased their overhead costs and those that are big supporters start wanting their ears tickled. I'm thinking, wait a minute, brother, let me hold the door for you. If that's all you think of us, and you think that we're going to be bulldozed, bulldogged by your threats, let me hold the door for you. And don't waste your time on the way out. What is the school now teaching in its classrooms? I've checked my class notes on the eldership, specifically an undated and unattributed handout that was part of the instructional material we had to purchase for the class. Once you notice Brother Hightower's first question, he says, true or false? We at the Florida School of Preaching hold and support the scripturalness of elder reevaluation and reaffirmation as taught and practiced by Dave Miller, Director of Apologetics Press, Montgomery, Alabama, and the Brown Trail Eldership, Hearst, Texas. He says in brackets, these are not trick, quote unquote, questions at all. My answer would have been during my teaching years with you and still is false. And I know Terry was one of my instructors. And if you know Terry, when you ask him what he thinks, <laughs> get a seat. Under the heading, the eldership, duties of members. I've got five minutes, I guess. All right. Um, well, let's see. We're just going to have to press on because there's some other things we want to get to. But during my term at the Florida School of Preaching, Brother Searsman took over the class from 1 Corinthians and outlined an outline material on marriage that he handed out. We read on page 21, and I give the references for it. And he says this, where one mate is not a Christian, uh, separation must not be caused by the believer. And he gives the following quote, Christians must remember that all honorable marriages are accepted by God. Being or not being a Christian has nothing to do with the way God looks upon the fact of a marriage, and that's emboldened in the material. God has put one law on marriage, and it is the same for believers as for unbelievers. Now, Hightower's next question is, true or false, we at the Florida School of Preaching hold and support the scripturalness of mental intent, quote-unquote, in regard to commitment in marriage and its subsequent imp implications for divorce and remarriage as taught and practiced by Dave Miller, director of so forth and so on. And he puts in brackets, my answer would have been, and during my years with you and still is, false. And I know that. If both parties of the, to a marriage are indeed proper candidates for marriage, then what does intent play, what part does intent play in the fact that they both went through the civil process, become married, and are now legally recognized as a married couple? In my notes, I make the comment that I was a, a, a credit manager for a finance company. I helped write second mortgages. When you signed on the dotted line, I owned you. I don't care what your intentions were. I, that doesn't bother me because when I've got your name on the line, I own you. You owe me. When somebody says, I do, I say in the sight of God and the laws of the state of Mississippi and I'll pronounce you man and wife and they've signed on the line, they're married. doesn't matter what their intentions are. And I have people say, I can't, make, I can't pay the note. And I said, I know. Get a moving house. Get a moving uh, car. We're fixing to come. Our preachers training schools living up to their responsibilities. Just to boil it down, I'm going to tell you no. And I don't say that flippantly. Brethren, I'm, a, I'm almost ashamed that I can't advise this young man that I have in mind up in Mississippi where to go. Now, I've told him about Truth Bible Institute, by the way. But I can't tell him where to go to, to, to take instruction that I would feel confident on the day of judgment when the Lord said, well, Gene, just tell us what you were thinking of. I don't know, Lord. I'd be afraid. I'd be very, very afraid. What about, uh, how do you, well, how do you know? If they won't answer the question, here you go. Do the, do the, school men, do the schools use men on the annual lectureships that support Dave Miller and therefore his apostasy on church government and his marriage intent doctrine? I'm here to tell you, yes, they do. It's documented. It's, it's in their own, their own uh, material. Which lectureships and speaking appointments are accepted by the director and his staff? With whom are they fellowshipping at these engagements? I know some of them are, up in, are going to go up to Virginia and speak. Are they willing, as in times past, to openly discuss their doctoral positions on a variety of issues? I remember when, when Crossroads was going on, Brother Carr would go up and, and help out in that fight. He wasn't opposed to telling people what he believed. 
Not if you knew Brother Carr. He was glad to tell you in great detail. Why do people change? Uh, we could talk about books. Let's just get to summarize them. In my scenario regarding helping a young man to find a school of preaching to attend, I confess that I would be hard-pressed to be able to recommend a school. I do not imagine that any school among us today, given the current view regarding fellowship, would be willing to submit to any effort to determine where they stood doctrinally. Lest one reading this manuscript or listening to the lecture delivered from it believes that this writer is, neg is too negative, I want to emphatically state, I am positive in outlook. Actually, I am. You may not get that from this lecture, but I am. And here's why. If the seed of the kingdom is indeed the word of God, and it is, it is only through this word one soul is rendered pure by obedience to it, 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Then how is it that any Christian believing in the power of God's word could be anything less than positive regarding the future? Are there problems? Brethren, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Do we have, you know, we're here to drain the swamp, but we can't because of so many alligators. We have problems. No question about it. So what do we do? I wish I could remember who told me that or where I read it. When things are going good, you preach the gospel. When things are going bad, you preach the gospel. When you don't know what else to do, you preach the gospel. Why? Because that's the only way, if the situation is going to be fixed, you fix it. The gospel. Brethren, we can't slow down the chariot. Roll the gospel chariot along. There's the beeper. Look out, he's backing up, Mama. I appreciate this opportunity. I regret the lesson had to be preached in that way, but it's, in, it's information needs to be out. We need to think about this. But brethren, let's press on. Let's not let this bog us down. There's too much to be done. People are dying every day without the gospel. Thank you. Sir, I appreciate those good words. I know that Gene was born up in the north in Ohio, but he got down to the south as soon as he could. I know that. When he moved into Florida, he raised the average IQ of two states. <laughs> but that's not to disparage Gene at all. You have to understand that Terry Hightower was already in Florida, so it was already low. <laughs> I think that uh, one must recognize that uh, whether it's churches or individuals, uh, we have in part, in large part, abrogated our responsibility to teach our uh, own young men to become gospel preachers. We've ceded that, uh, that responsibility to preacher uh, schools or train, preacher training schools. That ought not to have been. It's not that it's wrong to, to make use of them, but they have to be monitored and well, we just can't just uh, wholesale uh, give them blanket authority to do what they're doing. And if they are not doing what they're doing, it is, as Gene pointed out, because of the money. Follow the money. Well, if that's the case, and they will not change, uh, the thing to do is to dry up the money. And in, when that happens, they will go away. So. That is our task, to, to maintain the responsibility that we have of training our own young men to become gospel preachers, uh, not to see that or abrogate our authority in uh, overseeing that, and not to see to anyone else that responsibility. We can only control ourselves. Uh, so let's do that. And in controlling ourselves, we will control the uh, school's preaching to be faithful to the old gospel. What else can we do? We dare do no less than that. So I appreciate your uh, good words, Gene. Uh, we are to take them to heart, should take them to heart. Uh, we'll be dismissed now until uh, the bottom of the hour, about another five or six, seven minutes.